doctor? Oh, yeah, doctor. Is it good to be back home? It's good. Yeah, you need them. You need them about a month. That week is direction we'll get started tonight we'll be doing page 120 out of the church hymnal and while they're coming something that I forgot uh, was to welcome our uh, folks that join in by live stream and uh, I want them to know that we appreciate wholeheartedly them tuning in and and, and being a part of the service here at Temple Stand up, page number 120.
folks. If anybody visiting first time tonight would like to raise your hand, we'll give you a card. Let's fill it out, drop in a plate in a moment. Well, it's good to be here. The uh, place we stayed uh, had 32 separate floors. That's a long way. We were on the 12th floor. And that's what, about 120 feet up? About 10 per floor? And here I'm sitting, minding my own business, not bothering anybody. And all of a sudden, I hear a roar off to my left. And I look just in time to catch these six jets flying in formation, practically at eye level, the Blue Angels. And they went right by. I could have kicked myself for not having a camera out there. <laughs> Amen. It's quite a sight, folks. I mean, I was no probably a couple hundred feet from them, and away they went. Amen. All right, brother.
tonight. Let's stand up tonight and fellowship, shake hands as the choir comes down. seated. Let's have the ushers come up here. We'll take up the evening offering. Laura just gave me a special prayer request. The soul's been missing for four days down in Florida, and they need prayer. So please remember them in prayer tonight. Amen. Does anyone know the condition of Sean Eidmiller in Haiti? Last Okay, good. That's what he was worried about being. He said he saw 20 or 30 trucks coming in. Okay. And so he made it. They're safe down there. That's good. That's good. That's good. Please keep praying for him. Sean Eidmiller and, the, uh, and those uh, young people that he's ministering to. Haiti, as you know right now, is in a mess. It's a very dangerous place. And so remember this in prayer tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. All right. Brother uh, Ronnie Crane, lead us in prayer, please.
Michelle Keaton's going to sing for us tonight. I can invite her up.
I'm a child of the King. Amen. That's good. Amen. Now we're the sons of God. Now. Not future. Now. Brother Bain, come up and preach to us tonight. Amen. Did some good preaching this morning, folks. Yes, sir. Good preaching. Brother Bain. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Well, praise the Lord for his good mercy and grace, letting us be back to the house of the Lord here on this Sunday night. And let me say to this church, Pastor Lawson, that I appreciate y'all's prayers and appreciate your support of the ministry down through the years. This has always been a highlight and a blessing for me to come, and I appreciate your, your help for us to continue to go around the world and preach the gospel. Uh, just about uh, two months ago, I uh, ripped my meniscus in my left knee, uh, three different places, plumb to the root, they said, and I got immobilized for a little while. I was talking to this dear sister that uh, comes in on the walker, uh, I uh, did that, and uh, I sat there in the chair for about 24 hours, couldn't hardly move, and then got to the doctor, and he pulled a bunch of fluid off of it and gave me some cortisone and all that. I preached out of a wheelchair uh, the following night, and when I was sitting there in that wheelchair preaching, Brother Lawson, I saw people that came in with walkers and wheelchairs and canes a whole lot different than I had before. I never had any problem like that. But then to taste that and to go through that, I said, you know, it takes a lot for them to come to the house of God determination and some of them sitting there in pain. And uh, sure, that, that suffering gave me an experience that I hadn't had before. And so it made me admire a lot of folk that I hadn't really, you know, you just see them and you, uh, you, people laugh, say, oh, yeah, you say, pray for my bunion and all that. You have a bunion, you won't be have prayer too, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Uh, there's some things we go through, but now it's healed up. We'll be uh, uh, going back on the foreign field, different places. We've got ministry there in the Philippines. The special needs ministry is going real well, and they had, I think, 185 in that. They've had a bunch of uh, special needs families and kids saved there in the Philippines at this church, and uh, my uh, special needs son, Coulter, he helps uh, raise money for that. He's got a little book table that people give funds to, and uh, God's blessed, and every quarter they have these services for them, and that's special. And then God willing, we'll be going back to Australia. And I want this church to pray for something uh, in regard to Australia. Uh, the Northern Territory is Aboriginal country, and there hasn't been a whole lot of inroads for the gospel in that region of the world. Uh, but I've been laboring with a missionary up there, and uh, this young 19-year-old Aboriginal guy took me and him and a couple of fellas over to Aboriginal property, and uh, we went hunting one day after these uh, uh, the wild pigs and buffalo and all that. Uh, but anyhow, to make a long story short, I made friends with their family. And uh, just back at the end of April, two days before the end of April, uh, this young fellow was fishing, and he caught this nice barramundi fish, and he held it up in the boat. His little sister's with him. He's just 19 years old. Man, that'll be a good fish for us to eat. And she said, what's that, what's that little tag? He said, I don't know. said he looked at it and just about fainted. And it was a million-dollar tag. They have these rodeos. The government puts it out there. People come from all over the world. And it's the first one that's ever been caught. And he caught the thing. I mean, it just blew his mind. And... Uh, Anyhow, it's all over the news. You look up Million Dollar Fish in Australia, and it'll come up. Keegan's his name, and I really like the boy, but he needs the Lord. His sister just got saved a little while back, and that's a blessing. God's moving in that family, and it's been a hard road for that missionary to reach them with the gospel. Uh, but they asked him what he was going to do with his money, and he said, well, I'm going to pay my daddy's place off. We're eight. We've always been poor, so I'm paying my daddy's place off. And he said, I'm going to buy me a car. And then he told the preacher, he said, you know what I want to do? I want to go to North Carolina and go bear hunting with Randy Bain. I said, hallelujah. I talked to a friend of mine, Billy Kelly's son-in-law. He lives just right above me, and uh, he's one of the best bear hunters in the country. And, I mean, he's got him on the line. I told him about that, and he said, you get him over here. He said, we'll get him a bear. And I said, it ain't about the bear. 
It's about getting them over here, getting them in church, getting them around people that love Jesus and hoping he'll get saved by the grace of God. So would y'all remember that in prayer, uh, the Lord to touch his heart. And if it does, he's really respected among the aboriginal community. They're, uh, they're animistic people and they look at somebody like that and say, boy, they're really something, you know. But if he gets saved, he's going to be an influence in that part of the world. And there's a spearheaded movement. Got about 15, 16 of them coming at night services, and some of them are starting to get saved. And I've been up there a couple of times now and preached the Word of God. Was over in Australia 40 days uh, here a while back and uh, got to preach to a lot of those folk up there. Uh, but we've got Australia, and then we've got India in the cooker as well. And they've been through some real persecution there in India. Uh, but had a special treat for that. Brother Andrew Tompkin is in Iraq, and he's sort of in regions that you don't tell where he's at because he's reaching folk that you can't reach. But he's just in uh, the front-line ministry. But he met a guy from India somehow in his travels in the northern part and said, I need Bibles. Andrew, can you help us with that? And he said, I can't, but I know a fellow probably can. So he contacted me, and I got a hold of Brother Emmanuel Damara there in Hyderabad that we work with. And I asked Brother Emmanuel if we could get those Bibles together in about four different languages. And he got them, was able to sponsor that, sent them up to the northern part of India. And he's got the Word of God there, giving it out now. And the Lord's blessing and moving in that. So that's another special outreach that the Lord's blessed us with there. And so uh, uh, the ministry goes on. That's just a little bit of what's happening. And you know, we've got to get the gospel out of the four walls of our sealed building. You do that. I look back here at this camera. This goes out all over the world, and you've got a worldwide influence. We've got to get it outside the four walls of the building. A lot of folk think serving God is showing up on Sunday morning, giving God 30 minutes. I've done God a favor. Now I'm going to go live my own life. No. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Ought to be every breath. Ought to be every day. Ought to be every morning. Lord, watch thy will for my life committed unto him. And there are a million ways that we can get that gospel out, and we need to continue to do that. And this church does that, and I praise God for it. And I just wanted you to know that we appreciate your support, your help uh, on the ministry and, and the things that the Lord allows us to do. Amen. All right, let's turn, if you will, please, to the book of Jude tonight, the book of Jude this evening. And we're going to look in the Word of God. We'll stand and reverence the reading of the Scriptures tonight. I want to just read one verse, verse number 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over this service tonight. Thank you, God, for these folk that have come out on this Lord's Day evening to worship you, to honor you with song, and uh, Lord, give attention to the Word of God. And I ask you, dear Lord, that you'd give us liberty, grace, and power. And may you put this word down deep in somebody's heart. Lord, may you save somebody. May you help somebody, Lord, to dedicate themselves to you. And I pray you, the Lord of harvest, that you would touch this congregation, raise up somebody, and send them forth into the fields that are wide unto harvest, that souls might be saved, that you might be glorified. Lord, I do pray concerning this Haiti situation there the missionaries that are there. Lord, we know there's some things coming down the pipe that are going to affect a lot of people's lives. And I plead the blood over that turmoiled country. Lord, over the believers that are there and the oppressions that they're facing. Dear God, I pray your will will be done. Help Israel tonight. Lord, minister and move there. We know, God, there's a day when their eyes will be open and they'll see Jesus as their Messiah. But until then, Lord, they've got a lot of hard things to go through. And I pray, God, that uh, some of those would be saved as a result, even of what's going on. I ask you, Father, that you'll bless a Temple Baptist Church. Brother Lawson, thank you, God, for his long-standing ministry and his faithful labors of the gospel here. Lord, I pray the latter end would even be greater than the beginning, Lord. Get glory to yourself now. We need your help in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In verse number 18, he says, How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. The book of Jude is set 
with uh, testimony of that which is going to happen in the last time. I know the last days began from the time of Christ till the rapture of the church, but then there are the last times of the last days. And I believe that you and I are living in the closing times of the Gentile church. The church is not an open-ended project. You read Romans 9, 10, and 11, and you find out that there's coming a day when God is going to finish with the Gentile church and he'll turn back to Israel. He's not done with them yet. And Jesus said, I will build my church. And he gave us the story of a man that's building a building, but he didn't count the cost and he couldn't finish that building and how foolish that he looked. Well, the Lord said, I'll build my church and he's going to finish his church. There's a number which no man can number and I can't number it, you can't number it, but God knows because he knows all things. And when the last one gets in, uh, the church is going to be completed and we're out of here. And, uh, but he said in these last times, and there are several chapters of Scripture that deal with what believers are going to have to face just prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the book of Jude has often been called the vestibule of the revelation. Just like we were introduced to the church age through the Acts of the Apostles, so Jude introduces us to the Acts of the Apostates in the last days. And he gives us a description of the last time I told you. He said, I bring this to your remembrance. And he gives us an understanding. And I'll tell you, we're living in some wild times and wild days. I was sitting there talking to Brother Roger Lee and this dear brother, and they were telling me about them putting litter boxes in women's bathrooms in the school because women are identifying as cats. My soul, I never heard of such in all my born days. I said, well, the trouble with that is there's going to be some boys that will identify as dogs. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Uh, that used to be something they'd put you in the insane asylum for. Now they put you in the White House. Say amen right there. We're living certainly in the last days. And when you think you've heard it, I thought I'd heard it all. I never heard of that before. <laughs> Evil men, seducers, are wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You think you've heard it all? You hadn't heard it all. We ain't heard nothing yet, as the old saying goes. But Jude describes for us the condition of the last days. And when you go through verse 1 down through verse number 19, it's a very, very dark picture that has been painted. He tells us of the false religion, the way of Cain. That's the bloodless religion. Though God himself witnessed to Cain, and Cain rejected that witness, his own brother offered the blood of the lamb and said, it's through the blood of the lamb, uh, the Messiah's coming, you gotta trust him. He grew angry and he killed his brother. And yet when God marked Cain as a reprobate and sent him to the land of Nod to wander the rest of his life, he didn't give up on his religion. And the Bible says it exists even in the book of Jude. He said they have followed the way of Cain. And the way of Cain is a way of bloodless works religion. It's humanism making their own way to heaven. Now, he didn't make his way to heaven. He wound up in hell. As far as I know, he never did get saved. And this crowd that's following the way of Cain is going to wind up the same place that Cain did. And then he said, Woe well, unto them, for they greedily ran after the heir of Balaam for reward. That is, they're chasing money. They're covetous. They're in it for the greed and the money. You take the money out of church entity today, and a lot of this business would fold up in and of itself. A real man of God's going to preach if he has to pay to preach, if it costs him his sacrifice. He don't, that's not what he's in it for. God blesses and God takes care of his men, but that's not why he's there. He's there because God put it deep in his heart, not running greedily, making merchandise of the things of God. Amen. And then he said, they also have perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Moses, the man of God, had been proven to go down to Egypt and deliver the children of Israel. And there had been the mark of God upon his life and leading the children of Israel through the wilderness. And yet Korah and his crowd rose up. And you see, everybody that came out of Egypt wasn't saved spiritually. They may have been saved physically, but God said in Jude, he said, I want you to be reminded that uh, there are those that came out of Egypt that did not believe that later God destroyed. 
And Korah was some of that bunch. Oh, they physically kept the ordinance. Physically they came out, but spiritually they were not saved. And there came a day when Korah and his crowd said, hey, uh, we're just as much the men of God as the man of God is. And God's blessed us like he has everybody else. And uh, it's time for us to take over. And God said, draw a line, Moses. And they drew a line and said, if you're with Korah and his crowd, get over there. If you're with Moses, get over here. God shook the ground, swallowed that crowd up with their clothes on into hell. And the judgment of God fell on them. There's a lot of folk that are opposed in the true ministries and the work of God today. And they have no problem whatsoever condemning and criticizing and running down the true work of God. Anytime you find a true work of God, you're going to find out that there will be opposition. You cannot go with God and you cannot spearhead a movement for the glory of God without having the enemy raise their head up. And that's just that's something you have to face. I don't like it. You don't like it, but that's just something we have to deal with. And then he goes on to talk about these whales without water. He talks about the raging waves of the sea. He speaks of uh, Enoch's message, which is the same message for these days. He said, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them, all of their ungodly deeds which they've ungodly committed, and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And they say, oh, that's too hard to preach. And well, God said he walked with him 300 years. And the Lord liked him so good, he said, Enoch, come on home, son. It's closer to my house than it is yours. And he translated him out. He raptured him out before the flood came. That's typology of the rapture coming before the flood of judgment upon this earth. But Enoch had the message that described the ungodliness of this hour. Then he continues on by saying they're complainers, walking after their own lust, and so forth and so on. But then in verse number 20, the whole tone of this book changes. He says, but ye beloved. He's not used that word beloved. He used it now. That means to be loved much. He said, now I ought to talk to you, my children. And when you read through these first 19 verses, you're going to read some scalding condemnation of the wicked in this hour. It's going to be like a father going out on his back porch and the kids are out there playing in the yard. And he looks and at the edge of the woods, here comes these wolves in. And boy, they got drool on their mouth. That daddy steps out there and hollers, hey, hey, get out here. Boom, 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 boom. And the kids are just trembling and shaking. And then they come running to the porch. And after the wolves are gone, he says, now, Come here, children, I want to talk to you. And he pulls those children in close and says, let me tell you why I had to do what I do. Those wolves were after you, and I had to deal with them. But here, beloved, here, my children, I've got a word for you. Amen. And that's what God's doing in the book of Jude. He's firing the cannons away at all the apostates and all the wickedness and all the ungodliness of this age. God hasn't changed his mind. The Lord hasn't adapted to this woke generation, which is the sleep generation. He's not submitted himself under their liberal philosophies. He's not going to change his mind. He's God besides him. There is none else. And they can stubbornly refuse that all they want, but they're not going to change God. They might change him in their mind, but they're not going to change him in the word, and they're not going to change him on his throne, and God's going to continue right on. And if you're going to go with God, you're going to be the one that has to change. But I'll look at God's survival guide for these last days. You need a survival guide, and I do too, to survive in these last days. Look in verse number 20. But ye beloved, and then the Lord begins to list some things that he wants his little children to do to survive in these last days. First of all, he talks about praying. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. I said, first of all, praying is first of all building. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves. Now, as I preached this morning to have a building, you've got to have a foundation. And Jesus is the sure foundation. And you better make sure that on Christ the solid rock you stand because all other ground is sinking sand. And you better get down to the bedrock where you know that you know that you know that you're saved because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. 
talked to a dear man the other day, and he came out of Costa Rica, raised as a Catholic, and he said, you know, and I, I was just in a meeting there, and he just came up to me, started talking. He said, you know, I got a Bible. He said, I've never had a Bible. He said, I heard them. They gave me a Bible verse here and there, but it didn't make any sense, and it was just sort of confusing. But he said, I've got my own Bible now. And let me tell you what I've been, and he told me what he'd been reading through the Scriptures and all. He said, man, it is so enlightening. I said, it sure is. And I said, let me turn you on to a portion in that Bible, Romans chapter number 3. If you'll dig in that and you'll see what God said, you can find a solid foundation for your faith in salvation. Friend, these are days when people, uh, they're so wishy-washy, they have no assurance, they're not uh, confident that they're ready to meet God. But oh, my soul, God's children are building on the solid rock of the foundation of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of people that are so afraid of death I saw a lady the other day going down the road and she had on one of these COVID masks in the car by herself doing 60 miles an hour down the road. I said, somebody is living in fear. You've got people that used to come here that won't come out to the house of God now because they're afraid they're going to get COVID and die. Now they'll go to Walmart and they'll go to the steakhouse and all this, but they can't come to church anymore. And so they make the internet their church instead of showing up in person and they're missing out on so much. Don't make that your church. You get over here where you can see the smiles of the people. And I was in a church some time ago. They were afraid to even shake hands. I said, I know how to wash my hands after I shake everybody's hands. It'll be all right. I'm not going to live in fear. A lot of folk are fearful of dying because they don't have that undergirded foundation. Brother Lawson, I'd worked hard the other day doing a lot of remodeling on my house that I built 30 years ago and it's time to go back through it again. <laughs> you get on the road and stay gone, you just have to drop stuff and forget it and go on. But I'm going back, I was war slap out. I crawled in the bed, told my wife, I'm going on to bed. And when I did, she's got this big old fluffy pillow. I mean, it just swallow you up. I laid down, my head hit that pillow, and as I laid there, I said, Shh. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Son, this is how it's going to be when you die. I said, Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The Bible says you fall asleep in Jesus. Amen. You talk about a welcome rest that night to lay my head on that pillow and just breathe a sigh of rest. And God said, That's how it's going to be when you die, my child. Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. That'll take the sting right out of it. You're going to go to sleep in Jesus. Your soul and your spirit will be with him. That old body's going to rest there in the grave until the day of the rapture of the church. You don't have to dread that. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So you got that good foundation. Now continue to build. Whenever the man of God says, open your Bible, open it. And then whenever you sit down, don't close it and say, well... I've heard all I can hear all out of this scripture. He can't teach me anything. No, 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 no. Add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, and right on down the line. You keep growing as a child of God. And whenever the Word of God is preached, there's something in that that will help you be matured and grow and go just a little further to the glory of God. we got to keep building and stay active in that. But then not only building, he said in this survival guide, I want you to be praying, praying in the Holy Ghost. Prayer is one of the most useful, blessed weapons in the arsenal that God has given his children, and yet it's very neglected. And we think that we can get by without praying. But if our Lord, the sinless Son of God, spent nights in prayer on the mountain and spent hours communing with the Father in prayer, how much more do you and I need to commune with him and pray before the Lord? Amen. Prayer is a vital element in the life of the children of God. Matter of fact, when you come through Ephesians 6 and you see that armor at the end of all the armor from the helmet of salvation to your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel peace, the breastplate of all of that. And at the end of that, he said, and praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And you know, John Bunyan said there's that weapon of all prayer. All prayer. All kind of praying. All ways of praying. We don't have to go to a stone wall and bob up and down to do our praying. Amen. 
We don't have to come to a building and do chants. We don't have to look through a knot hole or some man looking like mama and dressing, uh, looking like, saying I'm papa and dressing like mama. We don't have to do that. But we have a place where we can commune with God in our heart. There's loud praying. There's vocal praying. There's praying in the heart. Hannah, her mouth was moving. No words was coming out. No, Eli said, you drunk woman of Belial. He said, I'm sorry. You misunderstood. I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I'm praying God to give me. Oh, excuse me. The Lord bless you. Little Samuel came out of that. You got Nehemiah, the cupbearer, before the king. And he looks like he's got the bellyache. And when your cupbearer's got the bellyache, you want to know what's going on. He inquired of him. And well, Nehemiah just lifted his heart up to the Lord and asked for wisdom. And he said, oh, king, I'm a man of a sorrowful spirit. We all want to go back home. And well, why didn't you just say so? Here's your permission slip. Go by the king's forest. Get all the timber you need. You get out of here. <laughs> you think God can't answer prayer just like that? And then you got Daniel determined to pray. They said it's against the law to pray. Daniel said, we still pray. And he prayed those three times every day. And they said, we got you now. They throwed him down in the den of lions. But you know the story how God blessed him and God answered Daniel's prayers. Do you pray? Do you seek the Lord? Here a while back, I, the devil jumping on me because I do a lot of praying in my automobile and on the move because I'm always on the move. Uh, before I was on the move so much, I got a rock altar at home and I go to pray at that altar and all, but a lot of times my, my prayers are on the move now and the devil said, oh, you're not praying anymore. So I got my phone, got my little notepad and I just started writing my prayers out every morning when I'd get up. I'd say, Lord, I thank you and I love you and I talk to him and then I'd say, Lord, would you help me here? Would you help me there? Would you help me there? And I started going back the next day and say, thank you, Lord, for answering this prayer. Thank you, Lord, for doing this. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. And keep a little prayer journal, a record, and you'll be surprised how many prayers God answers for you in one week's time. Amen. And it will encourage you to continue to pray even more. And if we're going to survive in these last days, there's going to have to be a lot of, there's many words for it, communion, supplication, intercession, prayer, it all has to be combined in our heart. It's our fellowship with the Lord. It's a two-way street. Us speaking to God, God speaking to us. And when the Lord puts something in your heart to pray about, don't neglect doing that. I've had situations that I've been in and then find out later, somebody call or email me and say, I've been praying for you. Is everything all right? And it's just at that perfect time. I was in Kenya, Africa one time preaching and went from Mombasa up to Nairobi and we went through Savo National Park where uh, they had the man-eater lines and there's a book entitled Man-Eaters of Savo and we stayed in a tent there. Two o'clock in the morning, there was a line stood outside our tent and it's just meshed between me and him and he'd see that big old head and he roared, shook me out of my bed. I reached over and got my Swiss Army knife and unfolded it not to kill him, but to cut my own throat. Amen. <laughs> Woo. But anyhow, all I could do just petrified. And I watched that rascal in that moonlit Kenyan night. And then he just whoosh, disappeared like a ghost. I got back to civilization a couple of days later and got an email. And somebody had emailed me and said, are you all right? Said about three nights ago, God woke me up. I dreamed you were in a den of lions, surrounded by lions, and said, are you okay? And I said, yep, I'm okay, hallelujah. But God had somebody halfway around the world praying about that yeah. while I was going through that. Yeah. Boy, this, it's a network of communication. I have people ask me all the time, Brother Lawson, how do you get in all these places? Where do you go like that? How do you meet these people? I said, well... It's through the network of prayer. And I'll have guys call me that I've never met, but somehow they've listened to me preach over some network or somebody has given them a tape or something. They'll say, I was praying. I couldn't get you on my heart. I, would you come and preach? I say, yeah, you know. And the Lord just threw all that. And while we're praying, the Lord does things. And by the way, if God puts somebody on your heart that's lost, you pray for them. And ye may act like that nothing's bothering them, but you can mark it down. If God's dealing with you, he'll be dealing with them. Amen. I was working on Volkswagens one time with this old boy, and he came in on a Monday. His eyes was all swollen, red, and he said, you've been praying for me? And I said, yeah, sure have. He said, I wish you'd quit. I said, why? 
He said, I've been waking up at night dreaming I was going to hell and said, I wish you'd quit praying. I said, you'd have thrown gas on my fire. Hallelujah. <laughs> Pray them on the Holy Ghost conviction. Pray God, deal with them, and he will do that. Yeah. Boy, how many of us got prayed in? Buried my granny bishop. She was 98 years old when she died. Uncle Clarence, he's older than me. He said, I saw faith in Granny Bishop when I didn't see faith in any of the rest of the clan, but she prayed us in one at a time, one at a time. You don't have to wear a suit of armor like a soldier to be a warrior. Thank God for these prayer warriors that know the Lord. And they're not going to give up on that grandson, that granddaughter. The world's got its hooks in them trying to pull them down. The broad row as hard as they can. But oh, thank God for those that intervene in prayer and supplication and communion with God. God said, if you're going to survive and your family's going to survive, praying in the Holy Ghost. Not now, lay me down to sleep praying, but praying influenced by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Then next, he goes on to say in this survival guide, uh, he tells us that we're to be keeping ourselves in the love of God. He said, I want you to keep loving. The old mountain preacher said, don't get the devil in you trying to get the devil out of them. And it's easy to do. But he said, you got to keep yourself in the love of God, not keep God loving you. No, he loved me with an everlasting love, and he's not going to quit loving me. But he said, you keep yourself in that bubble of the love of God because the world will sure move you out of it. As a kid, we used to have a creek down next to the house, and our entertainment wasn't Game Boys and Nintendos and all. It was the creek. Man, we had crawdad fights. We'd get a red one against a black one and an old jar lid. We'd have Samson against Goliath. And we had all, I mean, a creek is an inviting thing for a kid. But one thing intrigued me was these spiders that would glide across the top of the water. And then when you would reach for them, they would disappear. One day I got a, a little old mask and looked under the rock to see where they went. And this water spider is under that rock and he's in an air bubble. He took his own air bubble down there with him. And boy, I thought about how we are, as God's children, in this world, and the devil's always reaching for us and trying to defy us, but we've got an air bubble keeping ourselves in the love of God. And they look at you and say, man, why didn't you fly mad? Why didn't you just give them a good, give them a piece of your, you don't have enough of your mind to give a piece away, so just hang on to it, Amen. But we don't do that. We stay in that realm of the love of God. And if you start getting mean like they are, then what have you accomplished? Right. Charity never faileth. It may take a while for it to work, but it never faileth. And he said, you're going to have to keep staying full of the love of God. Then he goes on to say the next thing in this survival, God is looking, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And in looking, we're looking for his return. Don't ever give up hope of looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you're going to survive in these days, you've got to realize this is not the end. Oh, no. If I thought this was all there was, I'd go crazy. And I keep looking at all the changes on the world scene and all the wickedness that the governments of the world are, are putting upon God's people and the things that are happening. And if you don't back away from that and say, hey, they're not in charge. There's a master plan taking place. And he told us from the beginning how it had to be. We know all the world's going to come together. We know they're going to turn on Israel. We know there's going to come persecution. We know all these things have to happen. And the Lord said, when you see these things, said, don't hang your head down. Don't paint, pout and get discouraged. Lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. Amen. This hasn't been a pandemic. It's been a pandemic. God is putting things together. And one of these days, we're going out of here, and I'm going to keep looking for his return. Amen. And if you're looking for him, you're expecting it. And when you really look for somebody, you're going to clean your house. You're going to prepare for them to come. And if we're looking for him, I believe we'll clean our house. Amen? Amen? In this survival guide, he says in verse 22, I want you to keep helping. And some having compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, 
pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. If you're having compassion, if you're helping, if you're pulling, that means that you are reaching outside yourself. If you want to shrivel up and die, you act like a, a little old terrapin on the playground that kids are kicking around. And that little turtle flaps his shell closed and he said, I ain't coming out to play. I've been kicked enough. I'm not coming out anymore. And God's people a lot of times get kicked and pushed around and then they say, well, I got burnt like I ain't helping nobody else. I mean, I'm done with this. I'm just not going to be involved with that anymore and I'm just going to lift myself and not worry about it. Yeah, you do that and you'll shrivel up and die spiritually. You see, it's those that are reaching out, that are helping, that have compassion, that the Lord's going to pour His blessings on. You remember the woman that anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped them with the hair of her head? She didn't mean it, but she got more tangled up in her hair than she got on the feet of Jesus. And when she went out of there, man, she had a sweet-smelling odor about her. You'll never be broken. You'll never give. You'll never try to reach out and help without you getting the blessing. How many times have you went to visit an invalid or a rest home or you've tried to go help with a different project and you come away from there and they say to you, boy, what a blessing uh, you've been to me. And say, oh, no, no, no. I'm the one received the blessing. You got to keep that compassion, keep pulling, keep helping. And that will encourage you in these last days. Amen. Then he goes on to say in verse number 24, Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He said, In this survival, God, I want you to keep depending. Now unto him that is able. Oh, I'm big and strong. I'll get through all this. No, unto him that is able. You never outgrow depending on the Lord Jesus Christ. You depended on him when you got saved. You had to, to get saved. And all through this life, the Lord's going to make sure that you're going to continue to depend upon him. And when we start leaning on ourselves, God often knocks the props out, and we have to go right back to that place where we're depending and leading on him. I preach... A lot of times in different parts of the world, there'll be many times when I'll get up and I feel like a novice preacher that's preaching his first message, knowing that I can't and I don't have of myself what they need. Amen. But it drives me to the Lord to say, Jesus, if you don't help me, I have no uh, call to even be here. But Lord, I'm asking you to help me tonight. And there has to be that utter dependence. Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing. And if him being the sinless son of God said, if I of my own self do nothing, but that which the Father giveth me, that which I'll do. If he depended on the Father like that, how much more do you and I need to depend on him day by day? Yeah. The world said, oh, you're just using him as a crutch. No, I'm using him as my Lord and my Savior, and I'm leaning on him and depending on him, knowing that he is able to keep me from falling, to present me faultless, to help me through this quagmire, to help me through this dark world and this maze that we're going through. Amen. And he is our guide. He is our shepherd. We lean upon him and we follow him. Then look in verse 25. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. He said, I want you to keep worshiping. This verse is a verse of worship. And after all that he's taught us in Jude and all that we're going through, he ends up by worshiping. That's called the worth of God and calling the attention to his honor, honoring, honoring him. He said, to the wise God, to him by our Savior, be glory, be majesty, dominion, and power, both now and ever. And then that good word, amen. These are words of worship. You know, I see people come into the house of God and they are so taxed and so burdened that it's hard for them to even listen to the message, much less worship. But if you lay aside your cares and you'll worship Him, you'll find out 
that those big old mountains suddenly become little molehills. And when you get your eyes on a mighty God of majesty and glory and honor, all these other things are put in their place. And you'll go out after having a good worship time with the Lord saying, what in the world was I concerned about in the first place? I was with a fellow on Saturday and his wife was talking about her worrying about this, that, and the other. And he said, I don't worry. He said, I know the one's in charge. He said, I've learned to commit it all unto him. And God said, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And if you're a person that worships him, it gets your mind off of these burdens and these cares and the fatigue that'll wear us down. And we get our eyes back on who God is and suddenly our souls are lifted up knowing that he's our king, he's our Lord, he's our God, he's our guide. Thank God, what have we got to be troubled about? Because our Lord is the one that's on the throne and he's promised to take us safely all the way through. Hallelujah. So I've just rehearsed the survival guide. And he said there in verse five, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Remembrance is memorialization. And it's something that needs to be commemorated and rehearsed again and again. And these are verses that we need to go over. And, and I've just briefly touched on each one of these points. But it's something we can chew on in the coming days to say, Lord, help me to follow your survival guide for these last days. Let's stand all over the house. Pastor. Thank you, brother. That's good. Practical teaching. I do believe the Lord's coming back. Amen. When? I don't know. But it's called the blessed hope. What's that mean? It means that there is no hope apart from him. You're not going to change this world. So the hope comes as the person. And we look for him. Amen. And the scripture says, if you have that hope in you, you purify yourself. Even as he is pure, that does something to us. So that's good preaching, folks. Amen. That's good preaching. Enoch. What have we got? Page number 410. Near the cross. He walked with God. Was no more, for God took him. Like that brother said in the message, he becomes a type of the catching away of the church of God. Amen. The rapture, the catching up to be with the Lord. Right before the flood came. And this is what's going to happen. He has not appointed us to wrath. But to obtain salvation, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Not wrath. We don't look for the wrath of God. We look for the hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. But there's nobody with half a mind that can see what's happening in Israel right now. The stage is being set. The preparations are being made. Now, whether he comes in my lifetime or not, I don't know, but I hope he does. And I'll tell you one thing. I don't know if anything else that needs to be done for him to come back into the Holy Land. All right, go ahead, brother. some folks here at Temple and other churches I'm sure have people who haven't been back since the plague and uh, for various reasons like you mentioned tonight the message and I understand all that I really do but the truth of the matter is it's hard to project yourself as a real prayer warrior and someone who 
really cares for people who are coming to church and you're not. Think about that for a minute. Amen. Amen. Yes, you need to be here. Fail not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some men. And so much the more as you, as you what? As you see that day approach. And it's approaching. Let's sing one more verse, brother. I told you about the blue angels, but I didn't tell you everything. They went by, close, and then one of them broke away, and the others went on. He broke away, and that's what happens to us. You see, we do break away. We're not always going to be together, and the Scripture says, Paul said, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. I don't know how much time I've got here. have no idea. But I'll tell you one thing. By the grace of God, I'm going to be a hold of the reins, standing where I should be standing, doing what I should be doing. I cannot see myself anywhere else. Some folks want to retire and fish. Fishing's fine. Nothing against fishing. Amen. Good thing. Especially if you're catching million-dollar fish. <laughs> Who can beat that? Good night. Can you imagine? No, nothing wrong with fishing. The only thing I ever did was drown worms when I tried to fish. But anyway, anyway, I'm going to be where God wants me to be, doing what God wants me to do until the Lord comes back or he comes to get me. And then it'll be my time to break away. That'll come to all of us. Keep the faith, folks. I've kept the faith. Finished my course. Amen. Let's have a couple of men go to the back door. We'll take up an offering for this brother. I appreciate what he's preached today. He's ministered. Amen. He's been at it a long time, a mature minister of the gospel, ordained minister of the grace of God, missionary, evangelist. He's done it all. And it's been quite a thing to see how the Lord's used him in different places. Now he's into these aboriginals. There's quite a story when you get into the aboriginals of, of Australia. It's quite a thing. So uh, pray for him. Father, we thank you, Lord, for Brother Bain, for his ministry, for what he's given to us today, how he's ministered, what he said. Bless him, Father. Bless his precious wife, his home, Lord, his children. Bless all of them. Open doors for him. We know that you open, no man closes. You close, no man opens. And I know he's in your hands. No doubt in my mind, he's your man. Bless him now. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you Wednesday night, folks. God's working on something here. Hope you show up Wednesday night.